the scriptures beautifully describe the church as a supernatural structure that transcends this earth. Because all saints are members of it, wherever we find ourselves geographically, we can unite in fellowship with other members of like faith and practice. These local assemblies, because they are simply local and visible manifestations of the universal church, are likewise named churches. Whatever actions these local assemblies take corporately is bound, not only here on earth, but also in heaven. Whether it be ordaining elders or excommunicating heretics from their midst, local assemblies act on behalf of the universal body of Christ. The local churches are essentially microcosms of the broader whole, not subservient to it as though it were some central power, but independently and organically, acting as its representatives. Unfortunately, there are those who believe we must choose between one or the other. Either the church is universal or it is local only, and any biblical support for the local church is to be taken as proof that there is no universal. Yet the Bible clearly teaches that the church is both. First, it is universal. This is the one single body all believers hold in common. And secondarily, it is local, in that members of the universal church congregate with other saints in their vicinity to carry out God's work. But there are those who teach it is not both. They believe it is only local, and essentially deny the existence of a universal church. So what do the local church only proponents base this exclusivist model on? And what is the universal position based upon? Let us examine both models in more detail. If you condense the entire local only position down, you will ultimately arrive at one foundational point, the definition of the word church. Virtually all local church-only proponents argue that church only means a local, visible, called-out assembly. And since the universal church is not local and visible, by definition, it must be heresy. Further, they appeal to the underlying Greek word translated as church in the King James Bible, ekklesia. In spite of the fact that most independent Baptists who hold this position believe the King James Bible is the inspired, preserved Word of God for our generation, they generally go to the Greek for their doctrine on the church. They pull out their Strong's Concordance, look up Ecclesia in the lexicon, and read that Strong defined it as called out assembly. Then, every scripture mentioning the church must be spun or bent to accommodate this preconceived notion. But there are at least three big problems with going to Strong's definition of Ecclesia. First, bypassing the King James English to understand the ancient Koine Greek is problematic. This language died out nearly 2,000 years ago. God did not promise to preserve the ancient Greek originals. Instead, he preserved his word in our era in the King's English. Students of Koine Greek are really only making educated and often incomplete guesses. It is much better to derive our definition of church from observing its contextual usage in the English of the King James Bible. Second, Strong's lexicon is hardly a reliable source for defining Bible words. James Strong was a Bible corrupter and had a vested interest in turning people away from the words of God. He was a member of the committees for both the Revised Version and the American Standard Version, the two original deviations from the King James Bible. Indeed, Strong's definitions often mirror the words found in the ASV rather than the KJV. If you're going to define the words of the King James by Strong's lexicon, you might as well be reading an ASV. But on occasion, 
Strong's definitions do agree with the King James. And this leads us to the third problem with the local church only model's foundation. Contrary to what they believe, Strong's definition of ecclesia does not support their local only model. In fact, it does the exact opposite. Far from limiting ecclesia to a visible, called out local assembly only, his Greek lexicon actually defines ecclesia as, quote, the whole company of the redeemed throughout the present era. In fact, his entry opens with the definition, quote, Christian community of members on earth or saints in heaven or both. There are numerous other problems with the local church only position that church can only be defined as a local assembly. For example, this crowd will argue that while all saints will one day be assembled together, they are not now. Therefore, there is no universal church or assembly. But can't an assembly be called an assembly even when they are not currently assembled? After all, even local assemblies are not typically assembled Monday through Saturday. Are they only to be considered an assembly or church on Sundays? Furthermore, when Christ told Peter in Matthew 16, 18, Upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell shall not prevail against it, to which local church was he referring? If he was referring to the local assemblies, and if there is no one true universal church, he would have said churches, plural. So why did he use the singular? And when the Bible says in 1 Corinthians 12:12, 12, 12, there is one body and so also is Christ, aren't we to believe that there is one church in the same way there is one Christ? Christ is one, not many. And so the church is one, not many. There is also a big problem with their claim that the one true baptism is water baptism, initiating the believer into the body of Christ, aka the local church. Galatians 3 tells us this baptism is into Christ, not the local body, and that it results in no more male and female. Certainly no one would argue that there are no males or females in local churches. Obviously, the one true baptism is spiritual salvation, initiating the believer into the universal body, and water baptism is only the type. In contrast to the heavily flawed and unbiblical local-only model, the universal church model is based on scripture, properly harmonizes with the local churches, and even meets the criteria of a called-out assembly, supposedly required by the word ecclesia. Indeed, the Bible says all saints are called out and currently assembled in one body. 1 Peter 2.9 calls all saints a people called out of darkness into light. And Romans 8.30 says all who are justified are called. And Ephesians 2 tells us all saints, both Jews and Gentiles, have been made to sit together in heavenly places a current and real assembly. We are made nigh by the blood of Christ and turned into one single body. And this is not referring to some future event. Verse 13 says it is now. Likewise, Hebrews 12 says we are all members of the general assembly, the church. It does not say local assembly, it says general or universal. And again, while the local church onlyists might argue this is some future coming together in the clouds, the passage says we are come in the present. So we see that all saints are truly members of a called out, 
assembly. And therefore, the universal church meets even the local church only criteria to use the word church. Indeed, we are the Church of Christ, and therefore, any time we agree to meet with other local members of this general assembly, or universal church, God is in our midst, and the inevitable result is a local church, the visible manifestation of the invisible universal body. Matthew 18 is a powerful passage that shows us how the universal church is present in the workings and decisions of the local church. The two models are not at odds, they complement one another. The doctrine of the universal church, far from diminishing the importance of the local, actually places it in its proper context as part of a greater whole. In this passage, we see that the decision reached by two or three saints is authoritative and binding, even in heaven, because the universal church transcends even time and space. And wherever two or three members of the universal body come together purposefully in Christ's name, there is the church. The local church is the inevitable product of purposeful fellowship by members of the universal church. And through these local bodies, the ordinances and mission of the universal church are advanced. As an army is only as good as its platoons and brigades, so the universal church carries out Christ's commands only by means of the local assemblies. In this context, the local church isn't the be-all end-all, it's much more. It becomes all the more precious since it looks beyond to the greater body, the general assembly. When we realize that the local church is not all there is, but is rather the visible manifestation of the global brotherhood, it becomes all the more important to not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. It becomes all the more precious to break bread and study the word together each Sunday. And it becomes all the more sacred when we step inside those four walls and realize we are entering into mystic, sweet communion with the universal body of Christ. While this harmony of local and universal may seem elementary, it is surprisingly difficult for those in the local church only camp to grasp. And so, let us address the common objections and review the biblical truth and dynamic of the church, universal and local. We have previously shown how the early Christians in the first and second centuries, as well as Baptists throughout history, have held to the universal church. So, Roman Catholicism, originating in the fourth century AD, did not invent it. However, she did pervert it. The Roman Catholic doctrine of the Church is fundamentally different from the biblical and historically Baptist doctrine of the Universal Church. Rome's Church is visible, consisting of all saints alive today and currently in good standing with the Vatican. And it is hierarchical, with a chain of command descending from the Vatican down to every Catholic Church. By contrast, the Biblical Church is invisible, consisting of even those saints who have died or are not currently members of any local body. And it is not hierarchical. Each local church is independent and autonomous because its members are also members of the Universal Church and answer directly to Christ Himself. It is often argued that belief in the universal church can lead people to become ecumenical, yoking up with heretics and loose Christians, and that it can lead people away from local assemblies as Lone Ranger Christians. 
Yet this objection could also be leveled against the belief in the family of God. Most who espouse the local church only position will at least acknowledge that all saints are related to one another as members of the overall family of God. If believing I am a member of the same body or church as loose or heretical Christians could lead me to neglect separation from them, then so could believing we are both in the same family. Even local church onlyists believe we are all brothers in Christ. Yet this does not require them to abandon biblical separation, nor does it require them to become Lone Ranger Christians and forsake the assembling of themselves together. Sure, some may indeed use this as their excuse for dropping out of church, but that does not make the doctrine false. Many use the doctrine of eternal security to defend living lasciviously, yet this doctrine is still biblical truth. And as we have seen, the doctrine of the universal church magnifies the importance of the local assembly part and parcel with the universal assembly. It is so much more important to purposefully join with fellow believers when you understand that this is how the universal church fulfills her God-given mission. According to 1 Peter 2.9 and Romans 8.30, all saints are called out. And according to Hebrews 12, 22 and 23, and Ephesians 2, 6 and 7, all saints are also assembled together. Some local church only proponents will say this is only a present reality in the eyes of Christ because he can look ahead in time. But the Bible says it is a reality now. And besides, whose church is it anyway? Shouldn't the perspective of the groom be the one that matters? If Christ calls it his church and says it is currently called out and assembled, shouldn't that be our position on the matter too? Lastly, it is simplistically asserted that the universal church cannot ordain elders, cannot excommunicate anyone, and cannot carry out the ordinances. Naturally, it takes a physical person in a physical time and place to perform these actions. But similarly, the military as a whole cannot occupy a small town, for example. It sends platoons and brigades to do so in its name. And as Matthew 18 brings out, whatever is done in Christ's name, where two or three are gathered, there is Christ. And there is the universal body of Christ, the church. Local assemblies act on behalf of the universal body of Christ. And so we see that there are not two dueling church definitions at odds with one another. We do not have to choose between the local church and the universal. The saints assembled in local churches are the universal church. And the universal church is made visible and effective in the local churches. We are all members one of another. And so we should not forsake the assembling of ourselves together. We are all part of the same body, the same building, the same bride.